Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, great to be here. So, yeah, I was actually one of the co-founders on Assistant seven or eight years ago and recently moved to lead the product for conversational AI uh, in cloud, bringing some of the learnings. And I wanted to chat about this uh, <laughs> somewhat pretentious title on superhuman conversational AI. So, you know, over the past uh, decade, AI has reached uh, superhuman uh, performance across multiple domains, visual recognition, protein folding, playing games, and whatnot. And there is a question, you know, what about conversational AI? Are we also at superhuman capabilities for it? Are we close to it? Do we have agents, that virtual agents, that can actually speak and chat better than humans? So the spoiler is that the simplistic answer is no, we're not yet at superhuman conversational AI for generic conversation handling. However, in this talk, I want to take a more nuanced and optimistic approach to this question and look at it and show that actually, in some ways, we are already at superhuman. In other web areas, there is super promising a, a, a progress over the last decade, and definitely five years, where every year there is kind of a step function breakthrough. So, so I hope you will uh, come out uh, optimistic as I am. And when I'm saying uh, superhuman in this context, I mean either really superhuman, meaning it can do stuff that humans can't, or it achieves top human capability, like you know, a professional a voice actor, but can do it at superhuman scale across languages, concurrent sessions, and so forth. So let's go for it. In order to look at it, I will break down conversational AI to the three main pieces, right? Speech recognition, NLU, and speech generation, and basically show some fun examples from recent uh, uh, progress uh, and see how we're doing. So I hope you enjoy you know, the famous stuff post-lunch session, so I hope yeah, it will be fun and you keep awake. So starting with speech recognition, we are already at, uh, in, in some senses, in superhuman uh, levels. So first, just the ability to listen and transcribe, the way we usually measure it, the way uh, the industry measured it is in word 08, and we already have certain models in certain languages that achieve kind of 4% uh, uh, word error rate. And this is exciting because the, the, the overall accepted level for humans is at around 4.5%. So in some models, we're already actually seeing that machines can listen uh, and transcribe better than humans. And of course, they can do that at superhuman scale across a hundred, you know, many more languages, concurrent, and so forth. But it's not just transcription, right? Actually, machines can already understand beyond that the semantics of the conversation. Like, for example, understand the context to bias between words. I'll show you a little bit of some example. How to actually punctuate and format based on the content, identify different speakers, identify the surroundings, you know, handle accents, and so forth. So let's see a bunch of examples. The first example shows how can you actually take speech to text together with a, a language auto detection, translation, and language generation to create the superhuman ability of live translator. So let's see this video. And you know we will solve AI before we solve all of this presentation stuff, so I hope it will work. Thank you very much for being our first live translate interviewee. I love seeing what sparks joy in other people's lives. What sparks joy for Marie? For me, it is a pleasure for as many people as possible to finish cleaning up and lead a thrilling life. I'm surprised that it's translated so perfectly. <laughs> so what we've seen actually, we took the next step and we actually used on-device models. So basically we take this capability and put it on any phone. And actually we're giving now human, superhuman ability to talk to each other where there isn't any common language, which makes the world a smaller and better place to live in. All right, so this is one example. Another example. So this one shows how actually 
it, it is capable of identifying speakers. So what you will see here is actually two different speakers talking simultaneously to the different phones, but each phone identifies only that speaker and manages to identify. Then you see they are switching the phone, so the location doesn't matter. It's all about the voice. And then you will also see with some background, like TV or whatnot. So let's play. This is my phone. Please remember my voice. This is my phone. Please remember my voice. I'm having pasta for today. dinner tonight. So two different phones actually, you know, captured very two different commands. Now they show the same that it's not about proximity, but actually being able to separate the voices. I'm what having pasta for today? dinner tonight. Now it's with background noise. This is me speaking. Please remember my voice. We'll continue to watch all I of want this to have make its way through the region, tonight. and then behind this front, much cooler air will follow. Ahead of it, still on the warm side. Temperatures right now still sitting in the low 70s, 72. So we have seen, you know, again, being able to background noise very useful for AI bars and parties. Um, and of course, this is actually, you know, falls within the realm of superhuman and very critical also in the business, you know, contact centers and other places that usually you need to filter noises uh, uh, or you just can't and actually it solves for you by doing that. This is my phone. Please remember. The next example is very important for, for inclusion and equity is historically these models were trained on, a, 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 you know, kind of almost expert English speaking people with very specific pitch, accent, pace, and whatnot. And we've seen it struggling definitely with people with disabilities, but even with, for kids or old people or anyone with a heavy accent that, you know, that is a bit different than learner, learning models. So now we have actually speech models that can really handle a, a, a severe speech impediments. This is not the most severe, but this is an example. This is one of our researchers that has a, a, a ALS with uh, some speech issues. Here's an example. I'm Dmitry Kanievsky. Can you increase a bit the volume? I'm a speech research scientist at Google. I am speech research scientist at Google. Before Google, I work at IBM. Before Google, I worked at IBM. Before IBM, I worked at the Institute of Higher Mathematics. Before IBM, I worked in Institutes of Higher Mathematics. What we have seen actually, it's even cooler because what people with disabilities now can do is connect that to a digital assistant. So now actually, you know, they, they say the command their word, it repeats it, then there is an assistant that listens to the repeated voice, and then they can control the house, they can control the devices, communicate with people. Again, you know, very, very cool uh, uh, use of this technology. So we have seen uh, uh, how a uh, uh, speech and recognition reaching uh, superhuman abilities, and uh, speech generation uh, uh, doesn't fall behind. Gone are the days of these uh, robotic sounding machines. And today it's really impossible to differentiate between a generated voice and a human voice. And we're going to prove it. So I have here two recordings of the same sentence. One is a professional actor and another one is actually generated voice. Tell me which is which. This is the first. That's the second. She earned a doctorate in sociology at Columbia University. And this is a second. She earned a doctorate in sociology at Columbia University. Who thinks it's the first one is a generated? Yeah, yeah. Who thinks the second? Actually, the second is generated. Let's hear another one. Now that you are professionals and trained, <laughs> zero shot learning. A machine would have captured it, by the way. George Washington was the first president of the United States. George Washington was the first president of the United States. 
Who thinks the first one is generated? Who thinks the second one? It's again the second one. Well, we will call the voice actor and tell her to find the new one. <laughs> yeah, by the way, uh, you will, uh, I'll give you know, a, a bit of a spoiler. At the end, we'll show also an example of our own duplex. And one of the things we did with duplex is actually create a more noisy environment. Because to your point, oh, we don't really like when it's too clean. We like actually a little bit of a human touch, you know, the unshaved uh, voice. And of course, you know, this can do it in hundreds of voices, in 40 plus languages, right? Again, you know, superhuman. But it's not only that. Again, to your point, now we can actually clone any voice in using less than 30 minutes of recording, which is critical for, for brands and others that want to create their own voice. So here's an example. Don't worry, no more quizzes. Um, so this is the original voice. According to Science Direct, a flexed posture is characterized by an increased thoracic kyphosis. And this is us making her say whatever we want. Contact Center AI brings the best of Google AI to customer service. Again, the second one is just generated based on a super small set. But, so we've seen where you know, can generate super uh, magical uh, voices, but it's not just about generating the voice. Actually, there, is, there is a lot more of how you say it. For example, pronunciation of similarly written words sounds very different depending on context. He thought it was time to present the present. Don't desert me here in the desert. And, you know, so, so we're actually seeing, you know, and if you give it to the average human, it's unclear, you know, maybe this is you know, very simple, but, but, you know, it takes us a little bit of time to get it right. And it, of course, can handle actually completely, you know, out of domain and complex words, right? So this is clearly a sentence that was not in the training. Uh, Basilar membrane and otolaryngology are not autocorrelations. I cannot read it. Not, not, definitely not in that level. And of course, we can take it to the next level. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. How many pickled peppers did Peter Piper pick? And the famous one. She sells seashells on the seashore. The shells she sells are seashells, I'm sure. And of course, with a click of a button, we can torture her a little bit. And no, she's not sent. Oh, no. She's not sentient, so don't worry. Let's see. She sells seashells on the seashore. The shells she sells are seashells, I'm sure. Okay, doesn't get confused. So, you know, voice just speed generation and using all this understanding to get it right. And so I would say this is like top professional readers and voice actors that of course, again, can be a top scale. So we have seen, you know, voice recognition, voice generation are reaching that level. But what about NLU, right? So NLU is by far the hardest one to get to superhuman capabilities. And we are not there yet. However, you know, over the, the years, this is where we have seen the biggest and the most exciting breakthroughs. And this is why we are, you know, somewhat optimistic. And I'll take you now via a very short trip via memory lane. So some of it is trivial. So if you know it, sorry. If you don't understand all the buzzwords, also don't worry, but yeah. So some of us remember, you know, that not too long ago, definitely I think less than 10 years ago, if you wanted to do NLU, you would need a team of PhDs in linguistics that would write grammars in very weird syntax, trying to guess all the possible ways that a user may say an utterance or, or an intent, right? And then we started creating these models that, that started to understand better the semantics of words and sentences and, and slightly, you know, maybe short paragraphs using the sequence to sequence models that were very long and expensive to train. And then in 2017, we had this seminal attention is all unique paper that introduced the a, a transformers architecture. And transformers did two things. One, they introduced longer term memory, which allowed paragraphs you know, to go all the way to, to articles and even to long articles. But more important, they changed the architecture from sequence to sequence to so actually something that scales in parallel hardware. So you can actually now train much bigger models on much larger a, 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 a content and data for a fraction of the cost, right? And this is basically opened the door for the era of the large language models. And a year after uh, uh, we came out with BERT that introduced a way to train this in a scalable way. They actually showed that by self-supervising over public data, by, by hiding you know, parts of the data, 
you can actually train on the corpus of the entire internet without any need for manual labeling, which is of course expensive and slower. And then what we have seen is, is that actually two things. One, you can actually take these giant models that were trained on a very generic place, and if you want then to do a very specific task, you need a very small amount of additional content or data from that specific task. So you can easily actually you know, transfer, learn, all the understanding of language into a specific domain. Moreover, when you compare the performance of these large models to very specific models that were trained specifically for that task, these larger models actually were much better because the complexity of language by itself is usually much bigger than the complexity of any domain. So once you understand it, actually a lot of things go by, right? So, and then 2020, of course, you know, was the year of the uh, large language models, GPT-3 and all of these. Um, specifically, one interesting one is Mina from Google, which was a, a large language model that was targeted at open domain uh, uh, conversations with humans. And you know, bots can do open domain conversation with humans, but one of the things that actually stands out, one, many times they don't make sense. They're either inconsistent, they say one thing in the loose context and then they say the opposite or something that is inconsistent with that. Or they're incoherent, they're saying things that are not in alignment with how the world works. And two, they are uh, um, not specific <laughs> in a way. This is basically their strategy to, to solve that, right? So a lot of times they would say, I don't know what not, which is an excellent you know, answer. This is what I was told multiple times. However, it's kind of you know, unspecific and doesn't really answer the question. So actually, Mina was trained in a way that actually you know, is sensible and specific and reach you know, much higher levels, clo very close to humans. So it was like actually a new metric to make sure that actually these conversations are sensible. And a year later, we introduced Lambda. So Lambda actually took this capability built on top and actually made sure that it can do this conversation in a very hyper-specific context. And if we take a very cool and extreme example of that, Lambda can actually role play any object in the universe and actually have an open conversation on that object while keeping in role. So let's see an example of Lambda, and this is a real conversation. Having a conversation with a team member pretending that it's the planet Pluto. And please don't start arguing whether Pluto is a planet. Let's listen to a conversation the team had with Pluto a few days ago. I'm so curious about you. I sense your excitement. Ask me anything. Tell me what I would see if I visited. You would get to see a massive canyon, some frozen icebergs, geysers, and some craters. It sounds beautiful. I assure you it is worth the trip. However, you need to bring your coat because it gets really cold. I'll keep that in mind. Hey, I was wondering, have you ever had any visitors? Yes, I have had some. The most notable was New Horizons, the spacecraft that visited me. That must have been exciting. The team that created New Horizons was very excited to see me. I also sent them back a picture of myself since I had not been seen up close before. That's so great. What else do you wish people knew about you? I wish people knew that I am not just a random ice ball. I am actually a beautiful planet. Well, I think you're beautiful. I am glad to hear that. I don't get the recognition I deserve. Sometimes people refer to me as just a dwarf planet. Don't let it bother you. You're amazing. Thank you for the kind words. I appreciate it. Thanks for talking with me. Anytime, I am always open for people to chat. I hope you have a great day. So very cool, it takes the capability, of course, and all the value of the automated kind of a, a bot, virtual agent, or whatever you want it, but actually very, very, you know, on the fact, and in context, and consistent and coherent. So very big uh, uh, step. Let's listen to... And then, of course, you know, we, we all know that once it's large language model, we don't necessarily need to separate it only for conversation. We have seen code generation. We have seen the, con the ability to describe and to generate images, right? Multimodality, the ability to ask questions about images, right? And this is like every day almost we're hearing about new models uh, uh, everywhere. So usage is, uh, is, is very bloating. 
This year, we had another uh, um, amazing breakthrough with the introduction of PALM. So this is actually taking the scale to the next level. This is basically using a new architecture about distributed machine that allows us to scale to 540 billion parameters. You know, just for comparison, it's like three times GPT-3, which is about 170 a a billion. And with that, there is a qualitative a a a new thing. One, uh, uh, we did a bunch of... A a a a a uh, language understanding tasks, and for the first time, actually for many of these tasks, it is beating the average human. Not the expert human yet, but it's definitely super average human. And the other thing is, as you will see in it suddenly can do things that are qualitatively different than what we have been used to see from NLU, and gives a bit of hope in terms of the intelligence and the type of task that it can perform. So let's see some examples. The first one is explaining a joke. So here you can see a bit of a joke that has like kind of a geeky and unusual pun. And here is, you know, the, the, the model is able to explain why it's kind of funny. In the process, it seems to kill the joke, uh, but we found it very useful to train people that don't understand jokes. So uh, basically, you know, like a pod, like he's using like this multi-meaning, ha, 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 it's great. A TPU joke if you ever need one. All right, and of course, humor, to understand humor, you need to, to have intelligence understand the world, like here you know the words and what TPUs, what they are, and you know the names, and also understand language. Another example is explaining a chain of thought. So we all went to school and we know that being able to solve a problem is a challenge, but actually being able to explain and articulate how did you solve the, the problem is actually a much deeper understanding both of the problem and the world as well as language. And here we are asking the model a, 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 a kind of a simple math problem described in words, right? You know, a cafeteria had 23 apples. They used 20 to make lunch, but six more. How many apples do they have? And it explains, right? The cafeteria had 23 apples originally. They used 20 to make the lunch. So they had 23 minus 20 equals three. They bought six more apples. So they have now, the answer is nine. Again, you know, very deep understanding of the world and language as well as ability to generate language. And the third example is of counterfactuals. This is talking about scenarios that could have happened, although in reality they didn't happen. This is called humans are the only one within the mammal world that can actually discuss counterfactuals. It is considered the highest level of causal capability and prerequisite for that. And here we are seeing an example, right? The president rides a horse. What would have happened if the president has ridden a motorcycle, right? He did not ride the motorcycle, but what if, right? And the model understands that it would have been faster, right? So this is kind of an ability to imagine a world where there is, you know, of course, there is a different process behind, but it is uh, uh, um, definitely a new level of intelligence and ability to handle a, a, a Q&A. So we have seen uh, uh, examples for uh, superhuman or top human at human scale uh, uh, um, across the different components, right? generation, uh, 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 recognition, and natural language understanding. But I wanted to show how all of this come together in a product that is already in production, Google Duplex. You know, I had the fun of leading that team. Um, Google Duplex is famous. I think in 2018, we, we showed how it can make restaurant reservations for people. And basically, it's a, it's a speaking bot that sounds superhuman, um, building on both on bleeding edge, natural language understanding, and speech uh, uh, generation and recognition capability. But since we actually moved forward to do much more with it, and one of the things that actually we used it for is especially during the pandemic, is to get the most fresh results from businesses about opening our stock, are they open, and, and a bunch of other stuff. And many of these SMBs, they don't have a website or anything, so the only way to do it at scale is to pick up the phone. So basically, we use Duplex to pick up the phone, call these businesses, and get these answers, and like immediately feed that into Google Search and Google Map to make sure that people have fresh and accurate data. And of course, you know, this generates very fun uh, uh, conversations. So let me play one. Townsend Pharmacy, how can I help you? The mail is Hello. bot. Yes. Hey, I'm calling from Google Maps. Uh, given the current health situation, I just wanted to update your hours. I'm an automated service, so this call is recorded to improve Google services. Could you please tell me your opening and closing hours throughout the week? Do you want the hours for the store or the pharmacy? 
I was hoping to get the hours for the pharmacy. Okay, so Monday through Friday is 8.30 to 4 p.m. Mm-hmm. And then during the weekend, give me, mm-hmm. let me just double check, okay? I know mm-hmm. Sundays we are closed. Um, okay. And one moment. Okay, so Saturdays, it's 9.30 to 1 currently. Sorry, let me repeat all the hours back. Monday through Friday from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Yes. Saturday from 9.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Yes. Sunday, you're closed. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, got it. Thank you for your time. All right, no problem. Bye-bye. Cool. Right. And then people ask us, you know, oh, is this creepy, whatnot? So there is another one, short uh, uh, um, video that shows a little bit more of the capabilities and also how people react to it. And it's not too cherry-picked. Hi, I'm an automated system from Google calling to make a reservation for a client. Hi, I'm calling to let you know that a customer is running late. Hey, I'm helping shoppers locate a place to buy face masks. I'm calling from Google Maps. Given the current health situation, I just want to update your business hours. I'd like to make a woman's haircut appointment for a client um, for Friday the 17th. I'm calling to cancel a table reservation. Uh, could I just confirm that I dialed the direct number to reach Buffalo Wild Wings? Quería confirmar a qué hora abre mi tierra hoy. I'm calling from Google to verify your business name and address. Uh, I was calling to find out your business hours for today. Uh, today, because it is Saturday, uh, sorry, it is Friday, so I got my days mixed up. Um, Friday, we open at 8 and close at 8, or open at 6, well, my days are all off. We'll open at 7 and close at 8. Okay, got it. Thank you for your time. Wow, you got it. It's amazing what an automated system can do. Hey, thank you, Google Assistant. So nice to talk to you. Awesome. This is so, like, I feel like I'm in the future. You're awesome, Google. I love you. Mm. You're like the smartest computer I ever talked to. All right, cool. Thanks. Have a good night. Thanks. You're the best robot I have ever met. Okay, this is very smart. You're the most awesome automated person ever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So super cool okay, reaction. Thank you, robot. Your job is completed. It's it, it's amazing how you get you know you know imagine talking you you know with the average bot in a contact center, All right, Like slightly different emotional, but it's getting there. So so yeah, um, that's it for me. You know, I, I I very intentionally kind of chose a provocative and uh, optimistic title for uh, this talk, but I do hope that it was also thought provocative and a little bit optimistic, and you share the excitement of what's happening now and what's coming soon. And yeah, can't wait uh, to see what we'll do like, you know, two, three years from now. Thank you.